welcome to the fourth session on this journey of liberation from the land of slavery. We're going to look today at chapters 12 to 15. Last week we already looked at chapter 11, which was the announcement of the final plague. Today the final plague is going to happen. Today we will talk about the Passover, the celebration of the Passover that was celebrated then, that was instituted as a ordinance to be celebrated in perpetuity for forever. And we're going to see also how we as Catholics continually celebrate the Passover in our liturgy. And then we will look at the Exodus because this is going to cause the final plague and the Passover is going to cause the actual Exodus, the exit from Egypt. And once they have crossed the sea, they will be in freedom. So that is going to be the journey of this morning that we're going to look at. Start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Holy Father, we thank you for bringing us here this morning to study your word as we look at the Passover and the Exodus from Egypt through the Sea of Reeds into the freedom, first in the wilderness and later to the promised land. Lord, we pray that you also bring us on that journey towards freedom. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Say, Moses, lawgiver and prophet, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. We'll start in chapter 12, and this is where the Passover is instituted. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So this month of the Exodus is going to be a new start. And it is going to be such a new start that it is going to cause a new calendar. This will be the first month of the year. Unlike what it used to be in Egypt, now this will be the start of the calendar. Just as for us the incarnation of Christ that we celebrate with Christmas and then the preparation, the four weeks of preparation before that, the first Sunday of Advent starts the year. The coming of Christ starts the year here. The feast of the Passover, it will be a new start. And so that will be the start of the year, the first month. In fact, actually the coming of Christ, not just it became the start of the year, it became a start of a new calendar. We live in 2024 since Christ, eh? Anno Domino, since the, the birth of Christ. And uh, we date anything before that as before the birth of Christ, eh? B.C. and uh, A.D., eh? Anno Domino, since the coming of the Lord and before Christ. The coming of Christ marks time. For them, the Exodus story is what marks their time. They will count from there. And so... The Exodus is really a new beginning and the complete fulfillment of it will be the coming of Christ and his saving work on the cross and his death and resurrection. Now in earlier plagues, we saw in particular 4, 5, 7 and 9 that the Israelites were being spared. Everywhere it became dark but not in the land of Goshen. Many of the other plagues, it didn't touch the Israelites. God was setting them apart and they didn't need to do anything for it. They were just spared. God spared them. They were not required for anything. But here for the 10th plague, something different is happening. God will spare them, but only if they do something. So they need to do something now. And what is that something that they need to do? Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month you are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in a taming one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats. God is going to institute here the Passover meal. It's a liturgical celebration. It's, it's a celebration that later on they need to continue to celebrate. Eh? Here it's uh, the first Passover meal, but the first Passover meal will lead to the liturgical remembrance of that. And it is that liturgical setting that is going to save them from the 10th plague. The blood of this lamb that they need to slaughter 
is going to save them. Here, something needs to be done in order to be saved. We'll look at that and also its fulfillment. A new month, and on the 10th day of that month, this month will, for the Hebrews, be called Nisan. So the 10th of Nisan, they will take the lamb. And this lamb must be taken according to the size of the family, that if you can completely eat it, okay. But if, you can, if your family is too small, then you share with your neighbor or your neighbor's neighbor, also a small family. But the requirement is you must be able to eat it all. And this lamb is going to be slaughtered eh, in verse 6. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. So this lamb is going to be a sacrificial lamb. It is going to be slaughtered. It is going to be sacrificed. And they will be saved by the blood. But what is also required is that they need to eat it. And this is very important for our understanding also of salvation. Because how are we saved? We are saved by the blood of the lamb, the blood of Christ. But being saved by the blood of Christ does not just mean I said a prayer and I accepted the blood of Christ in a prayerful manner. No, I need to eat the lamb. And where do we eat the lamb? In the sacrament of the Eucharist. In the sacrament, we eat the body of Christ and we drink the blood of Christ. And Jesus says, unless you eat of my body and drink of my blood, you have no life within you. Not, oh, you'll have a little bit of life, okay? If you only pray to me, you have... No, you have no life in me. So... It's very clear that the way that Christ is going to bring a salvation, He is going to bring a salvation through His blood. Where did He shed His blood? On the cross. But Christ also institutes a sacrament, just as there is this Passover, the night, and then it leads to the Exodus itself, the passing through the Wet Sea, their salvation. The blood of Christ is also going to be our salvation, Good Friday, But the night before, Holy Thursday, Christ institutes the sacrament of the Eucharist. He celebrates the Passover with his disciples, but it becomes the Eucharist. Christ brings it to its ultimate fulfillment. There are many details to the meal. There are bitter herbs that remind them of the bitter times. There there is some paste that reminds them of the mortar, of the bricks that they had to build in slavery. So there are things that remember them of their slavery. But then there is the unleavened bread, because they need to eat it on the go. And then there is the wine, and there are the four cups of wine. In Exodus 6, verse 6 and 7, it says, Say therefore to the Israelites, I am the Lord, I will free you from the burdens of the Egyptians, and deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, with mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. You shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has freed you from the burdens of of the Egyptians. And in the meal of the Passover, there will be four cups of wine, and the four cups are named after these two verses. So, I will bring you out, is the first cup. I will deliver you, is the second cup. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, is the third cup. And I will take you as my own people, the fourth cup. So, these are going to be even related to the cups of the meal. And that's how the Israelites will celebrate it, remember it, that these cups of the wine are bringing us to freedom. It is bringing them deliverance, redemption. But the main part of the meal, ultimate dish of the meal, obviously is the lamb. Now when we look at the Passover that Jesus celebrates with his disciples, we hear about the bread that he takes, the unleavened bread, and we hear about the wine. In particular, the third cup. The fourth cup is missing. Why is the fourth cup missing? Because the fourth cup, he only drinks when he dies on the cross. The fourth cup is the cup of suffering that brings it to completion. Which is why in the Garden of Gethsemane say, is it possible that this cup pass me by? But if not, let not my will be done, but your will be done. And then on the cross he says, I thirst. He drinks the cup of our salvation, the one that brings us truly freedom and makes us his people. The main dish, the lamb, is missing in the Passover that Jesus celebrates when he institutes the Eucharist. Does it mean it wasn't there? Well, he was celebrating the Passover meal, so likely it was there. But 
the Gospels don't mention it because the emphasis will no longer be on that lamb that is on the table. But the focus shifts to the completion of that lamb. You see, when, when there is a foreshadowing, a type that is leading to its fulfillment, then the type needs to go. There's no more need for the shadow if the real person is there. So the lamb of the Passover meal, when Jesus celebrates this, is no longer needed because Christ is the lamb. As John the Baptist announces in John 1, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is the Lamb of God. And he now institutes as the fulfillment of the Passover meal, the sacrament of the Eucharist, which is that bread and wine have become, this is my body and this is my blood. And so we have communion with him. That's why we don't need to put blood on the doorpost because the blood of Christ saves us from within. When we receive him in the Eucharist, and of course, we are saved through the, first through the waters of baptism as they cross the Red Sea. That is baptism. And then the Passover meal, the Eucharist. That's why this text of 12 to 15 is so rich. It, it would be good that we don't read this just once. This, this is really worthy of our reflection over and over again. Because if we understand this, then we will understand the Eucharist. If we understand this, then we understand salvation. Salvation is not just that I accept Christ who died for me, but also that I need to eat the lamb, Holy Communion. It's an integral part of the sacrament of the Eucharist. It's an integral part here. Here it becomes very clear. They need to slaughter a lamb, sacrifice it. They also need to eat it. And so the sacrifice and communion go hand in hand, just as in the Eucharist. There is the sacrifice when consecration happens, we commemorate, it is made present that Christ is dying for us on the cross and he rises from the dead. And then Holy Communion, we receive him and we consume him. It belongs together. So in verse 5, we read that this lamb, which can be taken from sheep or goats, the one-year-old male, needs to be without blemish, unblemished. And in verse 46, it says, you shall not break any of its bones. And so it needs to be unblemished, it needs to be good, perfect, and not a bone shall be broken. Why is this a requirement? And later on this will remain the standard also for all of the sacrifices later in Leviticus. Why? Because when you offer something to God, you cannot offer God second best. If you offer God anything, it needs to be from your best. Otherwise, what will the... The person who is holding sheep do, the farmer, I, okay, I need to offer 10% to the Lord, so let, let me find the, the, the 10% worse sheep. I bring them, I will burn them in the uh, bring them for a burnt offering in the, in the temple, and then the 90% that are good, I can sell them and, uh, or eat them. No, we don't give the, the worst, we give the best of, our, of ourselves. Yeah, which is why even later on when there is going to be the, the tithes, the tents that need to be given, when somebody brings in the harvest, uh, let's say you, ha you have a, a field full of wheat, how do you give 10%? You harvest 10%. You offer it. Then you harvest the remaining 90 So you give first. Not, let me see, what is the leftover? What is the spare I can offer God? No, we give the best of ourselves. The best of our time. Do we make time for, for prayer in our day? And, and do we have a committed time? Do we have a committed time? Or is it just, let me see if I have any spare time left for prayer? I'm not saying that you shouldn't pray in the evening. You can pray in the evening, you can, although the morning is good. But is it a committed time? Or is it, let me see if I have any leftover time? Or am I giving God my best? The sacrifice needs to be the best. Unblemished. Of course, unblemished now also becomes in the bigger picture, free of sin. And this is how it is going to be said of Jesus. That Jesus is the sacrifice without blemish. Hebrews 9 verse 14. He is the unblemished sacrifice. The unblemished lamb. The sinless one. He who is without sin dies for our sins on the cross. Because he is the unblemished sacrifice. If Christ was a sinner, he could not have saved us. But it is because he is sinless that he can 
take our place that he can redeem us because he was not guilty. He was free. And of Jesus explicitly, it will be said that none of his bones will be broken. Jesus is hanging on the cross on Friday, and so the Sabbath is coming. And the Jews do not want any uh, person hanging on a cross in the Sabbath. So they're going to take them down before the evening falls. Because evening falls, that's the start of the Sabbath. Which is why we also have sunset mass Saturday evening, because that's Sunday. You're not actually going Saturday evening mass, you're going for Sunday mass when you go on Saturday evening. Because the day starts at sunset. And you can look that in the story of creation. So before the sunset comes, they want to take Jesus from the cross, but of course those on the cross need to have died. So they're going to break the bones of the criminals in order to make them die faster because if you, your bones are broken, you can't push up anymore and then you will die faster. So that's why they break the bones. But then when it comes to Jesus, in John 19 verse 32 onwards, so the soldiers came and broke the leg of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness his testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth that you may also believe. For these things took place that the scripture may be fulfilled, not a bone of him shall be broken. That is also a quote from the Psalm 34. Verse 20, any fulfillment here of Exodus 12, that of the lamb not a bone will be broken. Christ, he is the unblemished lamb, and not a bone will be broken. Instead, his sight, his heart will be pierced. What comes forth? Blood and water. Blood and water, what do the church fathers say of blood and water? Water is the baptism. Blood is the Eucharist. Again, we see these two sacraments that will give us life. And these same two sacraments are foreshadowed here in Exodus 12 to 15. The Passover, the Eucharist, the crossing of the Red Sea, baptism. The two sacraments that bring us salvation. Now they will take the lamb on the 10th day, but they will only sacrifice it on the 14th day. So why is there a four-day break between the time that the lambs are chosen, are taken, and that they are sacrificed? Because the Israelites had lived for so long in Egypt, it's quite likely that not all of them may have continued to practice circumcision. But circumcision is very important. Later on we will read that no uncircumcised person can eat the Passover meal. So they need to be circumcised. So a four-day pause is created so that those who are not circumcised can be circumcised. And then it creates that three-day for healing. Uh, the three days of healing after circumcision that we also find in Genesis 34, verse 24 and 25. Three days for healing. Then they can celebrate the sacrifice. So on the 14th day, the whole congregation gathers and then the lambs will be slaughtered. So this is why the liturgy, the Passover, will be celebrated in the households, in the houses. The sacrifice is done publicly with the whole assembly gathered. Just as Jesus dies on the cross and the crowds are looking on when Jesus is being sacrificed. And when does this need to happen? It needs to happen at twilight. Twilight is the time just after the sunset. Just before it really gets dark. The sun already set, but not fully dark in that. In between the twilight, the sacrifice needs to happen. But literally, the phrase here in Hebrew can also be translated as between the two nights. Between the two nights. And which is an interesting phrase because when we look at when was Jesus sacrificed on the cross, we know that he hung six hours on the cross. He was crucified at 9 a.m. Then till 12 it was light. Then from 12 to 3 it was dark. Which means after that it became light again. Otherwise it's not dark till 3. So till 3 it was... And then at 3 he dies. It becomes light again. But... Around 6 onwards, it will become dark again. So between the night of 12 to 3 and the real night from when the sun will set that day, in between these two nights, Christ is sacrificed. Yeah, Jesus also fulfills this, yeah, that he is slaughtered between the two nights. Okay, then verse 7. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they eat it. 
So the blood of the lamb is going to be their redemption. They're going to slaughter the lamb, they're going to take the blood, and they're going to put it on the doorpost. Now the doorpost is made of wood. So on the, you put it on the horizontal beam and on the two vertical beams. Which is the blood that is going to save us? The blood of Christ who dies on the cross. What is a cross? Horizontal beam and a vertical beam. The wood of the doorpost is going to be fulfilled in the wood of the cross. The blood of this lamb is going to be fulfilled in the blood of Christ, our lamb. Now, why does God here require this type of bloody sacrifice? We have seen of all the ten plagues that each of the plagues is a condemnation of a particular Egyptian deity because they think that this animal represents a particular deity. So therefore, you cannot even kill these animals because they represent this particular deity that would be considered deicide. But the Israelites, who may have also fallen into this type of idolatry living in Egypt, at least some of them, they need to make an act that is going to kill idolatry. Because the Egyptians wouldn't dare to kill this animal because then they, they're afraid they're going to die themselves for having committed the Isaiah. But they need to make this public act, this public act of killing a lamb, renouncing that this is the God. And the blood is going to be put on the doorpost, on the outside. So all Egyptians will see that these have all committed the Isaiah. If no plague will happen, surely the Egyptians will go around the houses with all these blood on the doorpost and kill the people inside because they committed the Isaiah. It was a public act. It was a public statement. It was a mark they were making. But this mark will save them. Because God will then know that these people are not worshipping idols. They have renounced idolatry. They worship me. They have put their trust in me because they have obeyed my word. So that's the act God is requiring here. And as I said, no, the, the, the Passover lamb is really going to be fulfilled in Christ. Yeah, the Passover saved the firstborn of the Israelites by the blood of the Lamb, which was sprinkled with a hyssop branch on wooden doorposts. Christ, the true Lamb of God, John 1 verse 36, and the only begotten Son of God, therefore He is God the Father's firstborn. So the firstborns are going to be saved. How? Because the firstborn of God is going to be sacrificed. He is the Lamb that takes away the sins of the world. And he will die on a wooden cross. So the wooden doorpost is a prefiguration of the wooden cross in order to save us from eternal death. They are going to be saved from death, meaning not dying here physically. We are going to be saved eternally. And he will give us life by becoming the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1 verse 18. So he is going to be this new firstborn, firstborn from the dead. Opening up the gates of heaven for us opening up eternal life for us. And perhaps another interesting detail is that the, the, the blood was put on the doorpost by a hyssop branch. Christ is going to be given vinegar. How? It is put on a hyssop stick. So you see how all the, these words are, are exactly coming back when the fulfillment comes. Christ dying for our sins on the cross. The real sacrifice that saves us is Christ dying on the cross. Hanging on the wood of the cross like the doorpost, his blood running down the cross. And so that is our saving. How do we partake of that saving work of Christ? In the Passover meal, its fulfillment, the Eucharist. And so just as the Passover meal then became a saving event for the Israelites, so the fulfillment of the Passover, which is the Eucharist, saves us because now Christ is pointing at the bread and the wine. The bread becomes my body, the wine becomes my blood. And so when we receive Holy Communion, we consume His body and we drink His blood. We are saved by His body and blood. Verse 8 onwards, They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boil in water, but roast it over the fire with its head, legs and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning shall be burnt. So the bitter herbs reminding of the bitter times. The unleavened bread because they need to eat it on the go. We will see that later. If you have leavened bread, it's very difficult. It needs a lot of space. But unleavened bread, you can pack it together. You can eat it on the go. And nothing shall remain till the morning. 
So the sacrifice also need to be eaten. If there was any left over, they would burn it because it's the sacrifice and you don't leave it left over hanging somewhere around as if it meant nothing. No, and that's why it needs to be burned. What do we do if there is leftover from Holy Communion in Mass? It is kept in the tabernacle because we don't also leave it around as if after Mass it means nothing. No, this is the sacrifice. This is Christ's real presence. So it's kept in the tabernacle and then consumed at one of the following Masses. Then 11, this is how you shall eat it, your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So the Passover is going to be eaten throughout the night. So the sacrifice after sunset, and then... They're going to eat it throughout the night. They're going to eat it ready to go. Any moment that the go-ahead comes, they are ready to move because they already have their staff in their hand, their loins girded, and sandals on their feet, ready to go. And so this Passover that is celebrated throughout the night therefore requires vigil. That night they're not sleeping. That night they're staying awake, waiting for salvation to come. Waiting for salvation to come. That's why the Easter Vigil, which is the ultimate fulfillment of the Passover, is also celebrated as a vigil. As a vigil. Personally, but it's my personal opinion, uh, I find it very, very unfortunate uh, when uh, when the Easter Vigil starts at an hour like 6 or 7. First of all, it's unliturgical because it clearly states in the rubrics that it should be celebrated when it is already dark. You don't wait for it to be dark. The lighting of the candle makes no impact at all uh, if it is still twilight, if it's still light. No, it needs to be dark. That is a liturgical structure. My personal opinion is I think even celebrating it at 8 or 9 or 10 uh, it makes no real sense to me. Uh, It should be celebrated at midnight just as we do with Christmas. And we should do all the readings and we should celebrate it long so that when the time all the baptisms are over, Actually, it is probably 4 or 5 in the morning and we will go home. Because that's the vigil they are celebrating. It's, it's a waiting. It's, it's, it's not, it shouldn't be done from a convenient argument of, of when can we sleep. No, it's a vigil. I don't know any time that I sleep at 10 p.m. That's not a vigil if it ends at 10. That's a normal day. Vigil means waiting. It means staying awake. Just as when Jesus celebrates the Passover, he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane. What does he do there? He wakes. Who are tired? The disciples. He takes the tree of them. What do they do? He tells them, stay away and pray. But what they do? They fall asleep. And so he said, so could you not stay awake with me one hour? The vigil should be a waiting and staying awake. And they will celebrate it ready to go. Okay? And the phrase I want to pick up in particular is that it says, with sandals on your feet. Now, where was the last time we heard sandals? The last time we heard sandals in this story was in Exodus 3 at the burning bush. There he was asked, remove your sandals. I'm sure he put it on back later and he's been wearing sandals all the way. But here it is being said, now put sandals on your feet because we're going to go. You see that that there is a renewal happening here. There was a time when he was asked to take off his sandals and come into the holy presence of God, be transformed by it, and not dirty it with his old walk of life, because that's what sandals are about. Sandals is, is in some way the way you walk. It's your mission. It's what you do. The old sandals had to go. Now sandals need to be put, because now we're going to follow God. With a pillar of fire and, and cloud, he is going to lead them the way through the Red Sea, towards freedom. They're going to walk in God's way, in God's way of salvation. There is a new way of walking. And here, they need to be ready to put on those sandals, the sandals of the mission of God. Verse 13. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Moving forward a bit to verse 21 to 23. 
Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go select the lambs for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel of the two doorposts with the blood of the basin. None of you shall go outside the door of your house until morning. Again, the vigil. They're staying inside the house, not even going out. For the Lord will pass through to strike down the Egyptians when he sees the blood of the lintel and on the two doorposts. The Lord will pass over that door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your house to strike you down. So here we have the word Passover. The celebration is going to be called the Passover. Where does that word come from? It comes from the fact that when you put the blood on the doorpost, when the Lord passes by, the destroyer will not enter, but he will pass over the house. He's going to leave that one aside. He's not going to enter in. He's going to skip that one and so the celebration is called Passover because we are saved so from that saving that is where the, the name Passover comes so the, there is the event the Passover event that got passed by this house and didn't go in and so the firstborn was saved now the celebration itself will also be named after that event and so when we say the Passover it means the meal and in particular the lamb the Passover lamb. And it needs to be annually commemorated. We'll come back to that in, the, in verse 14. So that is the primary meaning. The event that God passed over the house, he skipped by. And the meal is called, going to be called the Passover. In some way, this word Passover is also going to be applied to the people because they are also passing from something to something. They are passing over from slavery through the Sea of Reeds and through the, the desert into the freedom land. So there's a passing over happening there as well. Where is the fulfillment? Christ. Christ dies on the cross. He is our Passover victim. He is the Passover lamb. Where does he pass over? He passes over from death to life. And that brings us salvation, which is also helping us to pass over from death to eternal life, from the slavery of sin through the redemption that leads us to eternal life. So you see how this, this word Passover is referring to multiple things and all in some way interlinked. Verse 14, This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord. Through your generations you shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance. So it becomes an annual memorial, a remembrance. This is what the Jews do until this day. They celebrate the Pesach meal, the Passover meal. Okay, so the word Passover, Pesach. For us, we would link it to the word Paschal. All of these words are the same. Paschal, Pesach, Passover, all the same word. Okay? Passover is just the making it English. Okay, so since I shared some of my grievances. Another thing I don't really like, in the English language, we are currently in the season of Lent, and we are preparing for the season of Easter. I'm not very sure who came up with these words. Personally, I don't really like them. And why don't I like Lent and Easter as words? Because they, they don't show us any link with the Exodus. I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch, so I, I speak Dutch <laughs> in my language, and in Latin, and in, pretty, in French, and in German, and in pretty much all of the languages that I have some uh, familiarity with. These two seasons are called by a different word. The season of Lent, which actually just means springtime. Why? Because this liturgical season coincides with the springtime if you are in, in living in a country that has four seasons. So it's just a, quite an exterior link with little meaning. Yes, you can spiritualize it. It's a springtime, we, we, new, new beginning. Sure. But what is the name of this season, the season of Lent, in pretty much any language in the world? But also the standard, which is Latin, it's called quadragesima. What is quadragesima? 40 days time. So this season of Lent, in pretty much any other language, is called 40 days time. Why? Jesus spent 40 days in the desert. The Israelites spent 40 years in the desert. Immediately you catch the link when you say 40. In Lent, it's kind of lost. You see it on your faces, it's lost. <laughs> Easter. I don't even know what Easter means. But in pretty much any other language, it is called Pesach. Pasen. 
In other words, Pascha. Again, the link is easy. The Israelites celebrated Passover. We are celebrating Passover, but the fulfillment of it. The link will immediately be clear if you have a word, something like Pesach. You say Easter, nobody sees the link unless you study. I find that unfortunate. Now, the annual remembrance of the Passover, where does it find its fulfillment? When Christ celebrates the Passover and then brings it to its fulfillment by instituting the Eucharist. So the Eucharist, We celebrate that annually on Easter and every day. Because when do we celebrate the resurrection? In three degrees. One is every Easter we celebrate it on an annual. That's the big celebration. But actually even before in the church there was such a thing as the annual celebration. The first and foremost place when do we celebrate Easter? Every first day of the week. Every first day of the week. The day of the resurrection. And this is why we have Sunday obligation. Another grievance of mine. I don't like when, when, when in the pandemic, they said, we go for weekend mass. You, can, you, you go online, book weekend mass. The church does not know weekend mass. There's no such a thing as weekend. Weekend is a secular invention. It has rearranged the week, making Saturday, Sunday the end. No. For us, it's, Sunday is the day that God started his work of creation. He rested on Saturday, on the Sabbath. But because Christ dies on Friday and rises on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, this is the the new beginning. And so our day of rest, fulfilling the obligation of the Ten Commandments, has moved to Sunday. Not because we don't care that, 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 that God said you should rest on Saturday. No, but because we accurately recognize that when the fulfillment comes, the real day of rest, the day of the resurrection, then we will celebrate Sunday and we will go for Mass, and we will rest on Sunday. It's the fulfillment. And then, of course, at the third level, we celebrate it every day, because this is the day of the Lord has made. Every day is the day of the Lord. Every day is a day to celebrate the Eucharist. Verse 14, it says, a day of remembrance. And this word remembrance is very important. The root word in Hebrew is sakar. Okay, sakar. Memory, remembrance. You celebrate it as a remembrance. Who uses the same word? Jesus. When he instituted the Eucharist, he say, take this all of you and eat of it. Take this all of you and drink from it. Uh, this is my body. This is my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this in memory of me. Now, in English, the word memory may deceive us in this sense that memory for us has to do with the past. You have a photo album. When you open a photo album, you remember that yeah, last year I went to France or I went to Italy for a holiday and it was nice. And yeah, maybe you even enjoyed it a little bit when you're looking at the photos. But really when you look at photos, you also remember that you are no longer there. You are back here and today is a working day. It's a memory of the past. It's a past event. But when in the Jewish context, this word saka of remembrance of memory does not have the meaning of looking at the past and it stays in the past. It has to do with, yes, we look at the past, something that happened, but by doing so, we are experiencing it in the here and now. It is coming to the here and the now so that we can experience its salvific effect. Pope Benedict said this about the word. According to the meaning of the Hebrew word sakar, the memorial, is not simply a memory of something that happened in the past, but a celebration which actualizes that event so as to reproduce its salvific force and efficacy. Thus, the sacrifice of Christ offered to the Father once and for all on the cross in favor of humanity is rendered present and actual. This is to some degree true of the Passover meal that the Jews will celebrate every time. They were even instructed that they should celebrate it, applying it to themselves. But it is even more true for the Eucharist, its fulfillment to the highest degree of the word sakar. That when Jesus says, do this in memory, he's not asking us, oh, when you celebrate the the Eucharist, think back of the Last Supper. First of all, the focal point is not the Last Supper. We're not thinking back of the Last Supper. If anything we think back of, it is the fulfillment of the Last Supper, which is Jesus dying on the cross and his resurrection. When Jesus said on the Last Supper, this is my body, this is my blood, 
I'm not sure whether the apostles fully understood its meaning. But the next day, when they saw him hanging on the cross, and he is giving his body, and the blood is running down, they understood. When he said, this is my body, this is my blood, he is saying, I'm going to give my life for you. And so when, when we do this in memory of me, we're doing it in memory of Jesus giving himself on the cross, dying for our sins on the cross, shedding his blood for us, and then rising to newness of life. And these events, which we call the Paschal Mystery, the mystery of Christ's Passover, the fulfillment, the Paschal Mystery from death to life, is made actual and present at every Eucharist. Which is why the altar in the Eucharist is on a raised platform. We call that the sanctuary. That's not so that the people in the back can see it. That's maybe just a side effect. The reason why is it on a raised platform? Because that symbolizes Mount Calvary. Where Christ dies on the cross so that when the priest lifts up the hose and says, this is my body, yes, we see a hose, but what we should see is, is Christ hanging on the cross. And the same with the chalice. And then when he breaks it again, we see Christ dying for us on the cross. But then he takes one part and he puts it into the chalice. The body and blood coming back together. We celebrate the resurrection. On the cross, all the blood came out when, when his side was pierced. The blood for the Jews stands for life. When it comes back together, we are standing there at the open grave, seeing Christ coming forth during the Lamb of God when the priest breaks the bread and then puts a small piece into the chalice, the resurrection. It is made actual and present. We are standing there. It's, Pope Benedict would write in, in his book, uh, The Spirit of the Liturgy, I'm paraphrasing here a bit, but he is saying something like, time collapses. It's like there is a synchronicity of time. What happened then is happening now. We are standing there with St. John and Mother Mary at the foot of the cross. And we are partaking of it. Why? He says here, to reproduce its salvific force and efficacy. Christ does not need to die again. He died once and for all. But we need to receive it. It needs to be actualized in our life so that we can experience its salvific force and efficacy. It becomes efficacious in our life. We are being saved every time that we come to the Eucharist, when we celebrate the Eucharist, and when we receive Him in Holy Communion. The Catechism, 1363, says, In the sense of sacred scripture, the memorial is not merely a recollection of past events, but the proclamation of a mighty works wrought by God for men. In the liturgical celebration of these events, they become in a certain way present and real. This is how Israel understands its liberation from Egypt. Every time Passover is celebrated, the Exodus events are made present to the memory of believers so that they may conform their lives to them. That's how we are to understand. Memorial and remembrance. Okay, I'll fast forward. Uh, the, in verse 8, 15 to 20, we now see that there needs to be a celebration for seven days of the unleavened bread. Okay, so the Passover, the lamb, now a celebration, seven days, unleavened bread, and they need to make sure that there is no leaven in the house. The Passover, the, the 14th of Nisan, and then from the 15th of Nisan to the 21st of Nisan, which is the name for the first month of, of the Jewish calendar, is the Festival of Unleavened Bread. So a one-day celebration of the Passover lamb, and then a seven-day celebration of the Unleavened Bread. One plus seven, eight days event. What do we celebrate as an eight-day event? Easter. From Easter Sunday till Low Sunday, or now uh, renamed as uh, Divine Mercy Sunday is the Easter octave. Eight days here. One day plus seven. Eight days. So the Passover year already here is an eight-day event. For us, it's also eight days. They need to make sure that there is no leaven in the house. In fact, actually, the Jewish people, when they celebrate Passover, they, they kind of make a game out of it, just as we hide Easter eggs. They hide pieces of leavened bread in the house, make the children look for it. Uh, they will tell them how many pieces they need to find all these pieces. It's like a, an activity with the kids in order to make sure that, yes, indeed, there is no leaven in this house. Only unleavened bread during the seven days of celebration. Why can there not be leaven? Why is there this importance of unleavened? There is two reasons for unleavened bread. One reason for unleavened bread is that it needs to be small because they need to eat it on the go. Uh, you have big bread, it's going to take too much space. So 
it's for a practical reason. But for a more spiritual reason, the unleavened bread is that leaven is an imagery of sin. And in particular, the sin of pride. Why? Because what does leaven do? Leaven makes things rise from within. Rise from within. So you grow bigger because of yourself. That's pride. Who had pride? Pharaoh. What is God teaching the Israelites? Don't bring the pride of Egypt with you when you go out. Leaven needs to go. You need to depend on me. Yeah? So it's, it's, it's self-centeredness, egoism, pride. All of it needs to go. And so they even need to search the house in order to make sure it's all gone. What do we do throughout the year? But also, again, particularly in this season of Lent, we'll make sure we go for confession. What do we do first? Do We examine our conscience. We examine our own house, the house of our life. Make sure there is no leaven in the house of my life. There's no sin. There's no pride. I need to prepare for the sacrament of reconciliation. Just as here, they had to make sure that there is nothing in the house. Verse 24 onwards, you shall serve it. This right is a perpetual ordinance for you and your children. When you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, the promised land, you shall keep this observance. And when your children ask you, what do you mean by this observance? You shall say, it is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord, for he has passed over the house of the Israelites in Egypt when he struck down the Egyptians, but spared our houses, and the people bowed down and worshipped. So it's not just a one-day event that happened before the Exodus. It is going to be a memorial celebration afterwards. Just as Jesus celebrated the Eucharist before his sacrifice on the cross, and then instituted it for us to be celebrated time and time again in remembrance of his sacrifice. Same here. They need to keep this observance. And when your children ask you, the Jews, when they celebrate the Passover in their houses, every person in the house will have a role to play. And it is the role of the, of the youngest child to ask the father, Father, why is this night different than any other night? That gives the father then an opportunity to tell the Exodus story. It's thousands of years ago that it, it, it happened, but they will still tell this story, just as we are studying it now, because it's the story of salvation. And even more important, the Christ's cross, we reflect on it again and again and again, because it's the story of our salvation. This, this comes from the root word Haggadah, yeah, which is to tell the story, just as Jesus. What does he do on the day of the resurrection? He meets the two people on the, on the road to Emmaus. He tells all that applies to him because they have lost faith. And so everything from Moses and all of the prophets and all of the writings, what applies to him, he's telling the story. You shall tell, Haggadah. And the Jews have now a document called the Haggadot, which tells them how to celebrate the Passover. So what is very clear from chapters 12 and 13 is that liberation comes from liturgy. Liberation comes from liturgy. Yes, salvation comes from the cross of Christ, but how do we experience it in our life? Liturgy. It's very, very, very clear in this story. God is instituting the Passover meal to be celebrated in memoration. That's how he does it for us. Christ died for us on the cross. And we can say, okay, we don't need a church, we don't need liturgy, we just pray to Jesus. No, Jesus instituted the Eucharist as a memorial. It follows the same from the Passover, the Exodus event, to Christ's death on the cross and the Eucharist. Then finally, the tenth plague happens. For the sake of time, I, I don't have time to read all of it. Verse 29 till 30, the tenth plague is happening. The firstborns of the Egyptians are slaughtered. And Pharaoh arises in the night and all of his officials. And there was a loud cry in Egypt, for there was not a house without someone dead. Verse 30. And then, verse 31, this Pharaoh saying, He summoned Moses and Aaron in the night, said, Rise up, go away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go worship the Lord as you said. Take your flock, your herds, as you said, and be gone. They need to go and worship. And even Pharaoh hopes to get some blessing from it instead of these plagues. They then first moves from Ramesses to Sukkot, and they take the jewelry and clothing with them from their neighbors, which they willingly give them. And we already mentioned that in the last session. About 600,000 men are moving on foot besides children. So you include women and children, that means it would be about 2 million people moving. 
and they leave after 400 years. Here it says 430 years in fulfillment of Genesis 15, verse 13 to 14, in which it was said that 400 years later they will leave. That was for the Lord a night of vigil to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So the vigil, as we hear in the beautiful song that, that starts the liturgy or after the fire, part of the fire, and we enter into the church on Easter vigil, what is the first thing? The deacon or the priest will sing the exulted. This great song of celebration in which time and again you will hear this phrase, this is the night that brought them out of slavery. This is the night when Christ brought us victory. This is the night. Sing in different melodies, more beautiful time and again. This is the night. Just as here in verse 42, that was for the Lord a night of vigil, a night of victory. That same night is a vigil to be kept for the Lord by all the Israelites throughout their generations. And that is why we also do it. Verse 43 till 49, we will see the instruction that only the circumcised can eat of the... So foreigners shall not eat it, except those who reside with you, who work for you, even your slaves, if they are circumcised. Because if you're circumcised, you are part of the people of God. The same will count for the Eucharist, who can partake of Holy Communion, only those who are baptized Catholics. You need to be part of the covenant. And of course, you need to be in the state of grace. The chapter 13, verse 3 to 10 is the rules of the festival on the unleavened bread. Then verse 11 to 16 is that they need to consecrate the firstborns. Because these firstborns have been saved, they have been set aside by God, they need to be redeemed. In other words, they need to be consecrated to God because they belong to God. Just as Christ on the cross, we have been pursued and bought for by a price. And so there needs to be the redemption there, belonging to God. Then they make their way. This is chapter 13, uh, verse 17. And when they now need to go, they should not go by way of the coastland, the land of the Philistines. Okay, so if we look at the map. This is the way to the Philistines that basically leads to Gaza, which is where the Philistines used to live. So this is the land of the Philistines, the coastline. Many big cities were there because when you're next to the sea, there's food and there's travel, uh, there's business. So this is where a lot of people lived at the coastline. They, they shouldn't go there, maybe because they were not ready yet for the battle, even though God, of course, would win the victory. But... God is sending them the way of the wilderness. Because there needs to be still an inner transformation that, is going to need, that needs to happen before they can actually enter the promised land. So they are going... Traditionally, we would consider that they would have gone down this way. Although there are also theories that say maybe they have gone this way. And then the crossing of the Red Sea. Did they cross this Red Sea? Or did they cross this Red Sea? I mean, these... these the, the Gulf of Suez and the Gulf of Aqaba are both part of the Red Sea. So did they cross here at the top and then went down? Or did they go further here this way and then perhaps some have speculated that the crossing was here? And which then me makes Mount Sinai two different locations. Is Mount Sinai here or is Mount Sinai somewhere here? We will leave that to, to the debate of scholars. So God led the people to the roundabout way of the wilderness... Two words, the Red Sea, or the Sea of Reeds. And this is the question, which of the two? When we look at the Hebrew word, Yom Saf, Yom Saf does not mean Red Sea. And the word Saf means reeds. So Yom Saf would be accurately translated, the Hebrew would be accurately translated as the Sea of Reeds. It is the Greek translation, the Septuagint, that made it into the Red Sea. Is that a mistranslation? Not likely. They didn't mean to mistranslate the word. They were probably just convinced that the sea they are talking about is the Red Sea, and so they used the Greek word for Red Sea. But there is a debate about which sea that they crossed. There is no clarity on which sea they crossed, whether it's here or somewhere here, or whether it's one of these lakes here. And there's quite a few here. And these lakes, bigger lakes, they have reeds. So there's a lot of reeds around them. So 
it could be that the Sea of Reeds is a crossing of one of those bigger lakes. Some of them were more marshy, were more, more small. Those who like a more naturalistic explanation of the event will say, okay, it must have been a marshy lake, a bit small, with heavy wind, perhaps it could have been drawn dry, and there was a heavy wind, there was a, a big wind, so is it God using a natural event by the wind, making a pathway possible? Could be. But there's kind of two extremes on the spectrum. Eh? You say, no, it must, be a, it must be the deepest part of the deepest sea and it's really the miracle of miracles and God did it all and it's all impossible. That's, that's one end. The other end is, let's find the most natural explanation. It must be in as small as possible and with the heaviest of wind, perhaps it could have been possible. Perhaps. Probably it's somewhere in the middle. It's definitely God's work. It's definitely a miracle. I mean, that's very, very clear that it is God's work. That's not mean... He did not use any natural... He, it, the text itself says that there was a big wind, and it is describing the sea as the Sea of Reeds. However, it could not have been... Uh, I mean, there is this, this, this joke about this, uh, this newly convert, and he started reading the Bible, so he's reading Exodus, and at some point he started praising the Lord, Hosanna, wow, God is great. And so the parish priest said, well, why are you all of a sudden so excited? He said, well, I'm reading this text, and God parted the sea, and they walked over dry land. And, and then... You know, the, this bit liberal parish priest said, okay, you know, don't think everything's so literal. Uh, it's, uh, it, it was actually probably just 30 centimeters deep, and God, there was a heavy wind, and it was grown dry, and that's why. Okay, so the, the convert thought, okay, uh, maybe the priest knows better. So. so he read on. Just a couple of minutes later, again, praise God, wow, wonderful, God is great. And the priest said, did I just tell you, no, don't think everything's little. No, no, I was just reading. And he made them cross this 30 centimeters water, and now he drowned all of the Egyptians <laughs> in 30 centimeters. And that's a miracle. So, The thing is that these two events happen. There is, there is the parting of the sea and they walk on dry land and later on there is the drowning. So surely it was a miracle. And can God do a miracle? A God who can create the whole world by just speaking things into being can do anything. Anything. Yeah? And we should not doubt that he could have crossed at the deepest ends of the sea. Now, I am not saying they crossed it. It could be. It could be. The lakes, it doesn't really matter. It was a miraculous event. God parted the sea, they walked over dry land, and because the Pharaoh's heart and even the Egyptian's heart are now hardened, he is going to cross after them. And God is going to make himself known to them in all of his glory because he is saving them, but the Egyptians and Pharaoh himself are, is going down. And we see also that in verse 6, he made his chariot ready so Pharaoh himself was part of the assembly. And according to Psalm 136 verse 15, Pharaoh himself is going down. With all of his chariots and all of his horse riders. And God is protecting them by putting the pillar of cloud between them. Creating confusion. And then when Moses lowers his staff, the waters flood back. And then they, they try to ride out, but God makes the spokes uh, go crooked. And so they get stuck. And God takes them out for the evil that they have done. That's uh, the great event of the Exodus. Uh, the liberating that he brought them through the mighty waters. First, when the Egyptians look back in verse 10. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back. And there were the Egyptians advancing them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? And they have already seen the ten plagues, but again they doubt. Now they are chasing us, and we are stuck. Which is why also they are probably looking, those who look for which lake was it, there must have been a place where they couldn't really go anywhere. They were stuck, because there was this huge water in front of them. And then they asked this again ironical question, were there not enough graves there? If there is any land known for the graves, it's Egypt. People travel there to see the pyramids, and the tombs of Pharaoh. There were plenty of graves there. But God is going to save them. And then the second half of 11, it says, What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. They are already out. The ten plague has happened. They have already made the first part of the journey. So they are out of Egypt. But they are not out of Egypt. You see, they are out of Egypt, but Egypt isn't out of them. Yeah. They still have the Egyptian mentality in them. 
what? We should go back. And we'll see this over and over again. Let's go back. Why did you bring us out? Didn't we tell you, don't bring us out? We'd rather serve the Egyptians. Who should they serve? The Lord. Who should they put their trust in? The Lord. Verse 13, But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. This is the key phrase of the whole Exodus story of the crossing. Stand firm, fear not, and see the salvation that the Lord is going to work for you today. Who is going to do it? The Lord. And what is He going to do? Not just liberation from Egypt, but save you. Salvation. Salvation is what it is really going to be about. And do not be afraid, but wait upon the salvation that God is going to give you. God is protecting them. He is leading them by a pillar of fire by night so that they can walk at night and a cloud by day. God is clearly directing them. And then when the Egyptians come, he's putting the cloud the pillar between them in order to protect them. Eventually they are taken down. 14 verse 31. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. It says great work, but literally it's the word hand. It's the mighty hand of God that has done this all. And then chapter 15, we will see the song of victory, the song of the sea, the song of Moses, and the chorus of Miriam. Miriam will sing, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. We will sing this every Easter vigil also. There is now joyful dancing and singing God's praises because of what he has done. That refrain from Miriam is likely the oldest recorded part of the whole song. And the song can be divided into two parts. Verse 1 to 12 recalls the Exodus, and 13 to 18 looks forward to the future occupation of Canaan. And God is being praised as the Savior, the Warrior, the Redeemer, and the King. And I'm going to stop with that, and I'll save the part for the bitter waters made sweet from 22 onwards for the next session. Okay? You've been a little bit inspired by the story of the Exodus and how God brought them out and how it links with liturgy. So in conclusion, God is saving the Israelites through the Passover liturgy. Christ, our Passover lamb, saves us through his blood. The Eucharist is the fulfillment of the Passover meal. God saves. He brought them from slavery to freedom and brings us from death to life. And it is in the Passover liturgy, meaning the Eucharist, the fulfillment, that we are celebrating and experiencing God's saving work in our life. And what is perhaps the key phrase we should remember? Fear not, stand firm, and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will work for you today. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord Jesus, we thank you for being our Passover lamb. That you who brought the Israelites out of Egypt and through the parting of the Red Sea, you brought them to freedom through your mighty hand. And you instituted the Passover for them in order that they may be saved by the blood of the Lamb and, and continually to celebrate it in memorial of that event so that it may continue to happen in each life. But you are the fulfillment. Through your death on the cross and through your blood, we are saved eternally. And how do we receive this salvation? By we celebrating of the Eucharist, the fulfillment of the Passover. Lord, may we, time and again, when we come to the Eucharist, be freed and liberated by your blood. May we experience your work of redemption, liberation, and salvation in our life. Lord, make us more like you. Make us free, because it is for our freedom that you have set us free. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone.